Thanks very much for, uh, for joining us for, uh, for our conversation. We'll be talking about uh, America's role in Europe, and uh, the two guests we have is uh, Senator Jean Shaheen, who is the Democratic Senator from uh, New Hampshire, and Stephen Hadley, who was the uh, uh, National Security Advisor under uh, the George W. Bush administration, 2005 to 2009. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, uh, in the shift that's, that's occurred in the U.S. Uh, perception of its, of its leadership role in Europe in light of what's happened with, uh, uh, with the rising uh, threat from Russia. Um, seen from Washington, uh, there had been this uh, Obama administration pivot towards, towards Asia, uh, sort of a, a sense that, that, uh, uh, that from the US that Europe was an issue that had more or less been taken care of and that there were other more important priorities for, for the US. How has that changed now? I mean, is, uh, has Europe re-entered the, uh, the, the conversation in Washington? <clears throat> I, I guess I would look back a little bit, and it's something I tried to mention the other night. I think in the events that following 89, the fall of the cold, the end of the Cold War, War, I think people really thought that our vision of a Europe, that is to say Europe and American vision of a Europe whole, free and at peace, had triumphed. And um, basically, the European project was largely done, and the Europeans could carry it forward. And so, uh, while I think administrations stay engaged with Europe, it was a sense that, that, that we did not have to carry as big a burden, maybe, as we did in the past. And I think that was largely true, as long as Russia seemed to be on a path of, over time, with a lot of, you know, ups and downs of sort of convergence in the direction of European integrating with Europe and European values. But when President Putin decided, um, as he presaged in his invasion of Georgia in 2008 and then with what he did in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, when he clearly decided to take Russia in a very different direction, the game changed, and I think both Europeans and Americans were slow to realize that the game had changed, and I think we're still in a little bit of denial as to what has happened. And I think at that point, uh, it was important for the United States in a way to, sh to re-engage uh, with Europe, and I think the Europeans to recognize that in managing a Putin moving in the direction he was moving, they needed a, a, an American role. And I think it's unfortunate that we got all this conversation about the pivot to Asia roughly in the same time because it was the administration wasn't turning its back on anybody. It simply wanted to make the point that Asia was important and we were going to, I would say, stay engaged in Asia had we been for many administrations. But I think it was unfortunate because it, it sent the signal that right at the time when actually Europe needed America more, we were, we were turning our back on Europe. I think it wasn't true, but I think it was unfortunate. And it fed this notion that uh, America was, uh, was disengaged from Europe. I think uh, the United States, uh, the administration is responding uh, we heard some of the things uh, that we're doing in terms of uh, training and positioning forces here and uh, greater exercises. I think the problem is we're, we're behind the power curve and we're reacting and Putin has the initiative and Russian policy has the initiative and that's not a good place to be. Well, I certainly agree with Stephen and I do think that people misinterpreted the pivot to Asia as meaning that we were no longer going to be engaged in Europe, and I don't think that was ever the case. I think um, the transatlantic relationship is the strongest one the United States has, and so I don't think that was going to change. And the fact is that Putin's actions in the Ukraine, in Eastern Europe, have probably united Congress on foreign policy more than anything since I've been there and focused more attention on Europe than anything since I've been there. Um, so I do think we need to respond and we need to work with the EU, with our partners in Europe in thinking about how we more robustly respond to Putin. What's your assessment of the, uh, when, when this uh, perception of Russia changed and the, and the crisis started with the, uh, with the seizure of uh, Crimea, what was your assessment of 
the state of uh, particularly EU-US uh, relations. I mean, I'd, I'd covered Poland for a long time for the FT, and uh, uh, there was a noticeable shift uh, in Poland and other Central European countries where uh, the dynamic was that Berlin was the main foreign policy partner and that the, the main priority of, the, of this region was to build a strong presence in the EU, and the US sort of faded into the background. It was sort of there as a NATO ally, and it had sort of some security dimension, but, but it wasn't, uh, for many of these countries, the key foreign partner anymore. And uh, do you see that shifting now, that, that, that uh, because security is a more important issue, that, that the US is now, uh, just plays a larger role in, in the European debate than it did before? Well, maybe I'm colored by being a member of Congress, but I don't think we in Congress ever saw um, the U.S. role in Europe fading. Okay. Um, and I think it needs, as I said, I think we, we need to be more um, strategic in our response. I think we need to work very closely with the EU and with NATO in thinking about um, not just how we are responding on Ukraine, but also on um, what Putin's next steps are going to be and how how we can take action now to counter whatever those next <coughs> steps are. I think there's a little bit of a dilemma here on the one hand, um, and we had this in dealing with the Georgia crisis in 2008, uh, Russia's invasion of Georgia. Uh, we didn't want to make it a great power confrontation with the United States and Russia because we thought that would make it more difficult to resolve it. So we were content to let France lead the negotiations, though we were all over it in terms of talking with them uh, in terms of what they were doing. So I think there's, there's a little bit of a sense of that, that maybe it's not a bad thing for the Germans to be in the lead. But I think, as I say, once Putin took Russia in a different direction, uh, I don't think it was going to be, and I do not think it'll be resolved without America and Europe working together very closely. Uh, Europe clearly has the economic weight with Ukraine, the economic weight with Russia, but the United States, because of its role in NATO, still has the military dimension and the geopolitical weight. And the only way we are going to get uh, Russia policy redirected is if we, in a very strategic uh, and integrated way, use dip diplomatic, economic, military, and geopolitical influence. And that means Europe and the United States need to work to together in a very integrated and coordinated way. I think we're relearning that for the reasons I say. I think we sort of fell out of practice. Um, and, you know, there's going to be some you know, fits and starts in that, but I think that's what you're seeing emerge. Again, my concern is that we just seem to be lagging events rather than leading events. You know, one of the other things that I've been hearing since I've been here, and we've been hearing it earlier, is how effective Russia has been with their propaganda. Mm -hmm. And we really have not ramped up um, either from the EU or from the US um, you know, I remember growing up in the 50s, Radio Free Europe, the response to the Soviets in Eastern Europe, and, and a real effort in the United States to provide a counter to what they were hearing from Soviet Russia. And we have not done that in response to the current situation. And we really need to think about how, how are we going to all work together to counter the Russian propaganda machine, because that's a critical piece of how we need to respond. And, and I think there's one other piece in addition to that, and I completely agree with the senator on that. We spent a lot of time talking about what the United States should do, what Europe should do, what the United States and Europe should do together. I think it's very important for us to spend some time focusing and talking about what the states that are on the border, that are at risk, um, to uh, the kinds of tactics that Putin uh, used in Georgia and Ukraine, what they need to be doing. Because I think the way to think about it is they need to harden their own societies to be more resistant to Russian propaganda, to Russian sub uh, subversion. Um, how do they do this? Uh, I think there are a number of things they need to think about, which is one, 
dealing with, to the extent they have Russian minorities, dealing with the grievances of those Russian minorities, make sure that they are included and invested in the system. They can do a lot towards countering the propaganda. Uh, don't let the Russians dominate their own media inside their countries. They can do some things to counter the corruption, which is a vehicle that Russia uses to buy influence among business communities, among uh, the uh, political figures. Um, they can talk about their own defense preparations and how, you know, none of them are going to defeat the Russian army, but they can raise the cost for Putin doing the kinds of things in their country that they're, he is doing in Ukraine. So I think the other dimension, if, if we're really going to talk about a comprehensive solution, is one of the things that the states that are at risk can do to harden themselves, and we can help them in a number of these things. So that's part of the configuration, too, of putting together a comprehensive strategy that's going to deter Russian policy, box them in, and maybe hopefully cause them to reconsider what they're doing. But doesn't part of this, uh, you can get the Estonians or the Latvians to, to harden uh, their, uh, themselves and, and increase their defense spending a little bit and that sort of thing, but um, the, the call from much of the region uh, has been for an actual full-on NATO deployment, a permanent deployment. Uh, uh, former, former Minister Sikorsky has talked about two heavy brigades uh, being based here. Um, is there any sense that the U.S. would be willing to do something like that? I mean, the, the West Europeans are not, and if you look at opinion surveys, uh, there's not even a lot of enthusiasm for, for Article 5, that, uh, that if, if there is an attack, uh, that West, uh, the Western European publics uh, are not enormously keen on, on uh, sending troops to fight. Um, well, uh, one, I think one of the uh, burdens on leaders is to educate their populations as to what the threats are and what needs to be done about them. So uh, I would take those opinion polls not as a straitjacket or not as written in stone, but an indication that political leaders have more to do to get their publics to understand what's at stake here. And secondly, I think the kinds of things that uh, Roderick Sikorsky was talking about our right, and, and you've, you've had a couple panels here over the last two days that show that we are moving in that direction. Training exercises have been expanded. The American uh, presence is being expanded. We are doing training. I think, um, and I think we shouldn't get caught up on the issue of permanent stationing. If we are, for example, there's been discussion about pre-positioning military in equipment in the Baltic states, in Poland, and in uh, the Balkans, and then rotating American forces in to exercise using that equipment, and do it on a rotational presence, so it just so happens that 24-7 there's always Americans on the ground in these places. That's good enough, uh, because the message you want to send is one of solidarity, about NATO engagement, about American engagement, and the risk to the Russians that if they pull the kind of thing they did in Georgia or Ukraine, they may bump up against NATO forces and American forces. That's a strong message, and that's the kind of message that we need to be sending. And I would argue that we've started doing that. That right. NATO's response to Russia's incursion into Ukraine was to send troops uh, to the Baltics. Um, it was to ramp up exercises. In Congress, we've um, already appropriated almost a billion dollars for the European Reassurance Initiative um, to provide for more training exercises, more troops, um, more equipment, and to, as Stephen said, to rotate those around um, in the appropriate spots in Europe. We have the phased adaptive approach uh, defense system that's going in here in Poland and in Romania. Um, so I think we are doing a lot to respond to what Putin has done. And the fact is, one of the challenges that European countries have is to ramp up their own defense spending in a way that shows that, that they're committed um, to a united front here. And we saw some pledges in Wales that countries were willing to do that. Um, but now we need to see people follow through on that. And, That's and this long is, been a source of enormous frustration on the U.S. side, is, is sort of the lackluster European response when it comes to defense spending. Uh, well, I think 
you know, Stephen talked about the history in Europe and with the transatlantic relationship. Well, people have to um, look at that history, World War II, the Cold War, um, all of the efforts that United States and Europe engaged in, but we're in a different time now. And just as Europe has its own challenges, we have our own challenges in the United States. And we're coming out of um, the longest war in Afghanistan um, and in Iraq. And the public in America is concerned about potential uh, engagement around the world. So we have to be responsive to those concerns just as Europeans have to be responsible to their own publics. And this has got to be a combined, united effort. Um, we've all got to work on this together. I think we need, it's, and I agree with everything the senator said on that. Uh, I think we need to distinguish, though, between long-term measures and short-term measures. Right. Long-term measures that are going to reduce Russians' leverage over Europe. And so things like, and again, these are already underway. Um, restructuring the energy market so that Europe is less dependent on uh, Russian oil and gas. Uh, getting defense spending. Uh, you know, we, we talk about 2%. Two, two you know, when I was doing NATO issues under the George H.W. Bush administration, it was all about 4%. And now we're settling for 2%. You know, let's show that Europe is going to have real commitment to military forces. Uh, let's do the TTIP, the Trade and Investment Partnership between uh, Europe and the United States. But those are signals of declining leverage, but they will be a while before they take into effect. So let's not say, you know, well, if we raise our defense spending to 2%, we've solved the problem. In the short run, deterring and changing the calculation on which Russian policy is baked is going to be things about exercises and deployments and pre-positioning of equipment and a, a, a really willingness for leaders to make it clear that we're drawing a line to what Putin can do militarily. So we've got to be playing for the long run, but also be aggressive on the short run. But is that is that doable in today's environment because in the in the late 40s when the when the cold war started it was possible to present the soviet union as an actual threat to the a realistic threat to the west uh western way of life and and that sort of slow galvanization of western forces to create nato and to and to sort of contain the the ussr is today's russia uh the kind of threat which you can use to galvanize West European and U.S. publics to actually spend more money and get involved in this way, or uh, or is it is it something that people talk about at conferences like this, but the, but that the average uh, population is just simply not going to see as anything that they want to get that engaged with and that they see as a threat to their way of life? I, I think, as I said, the action that Russia has taken and the current threat to other parts to other countries has probably galvanized Congress right. um, around Europe more than anything else since I've been there. And so I do think um, people view that as a real concern. And there's still this residue of the Cold War and what that was like, um, certainly in my generation and for a, a lot of people who still are decision makers in the US. And so I do think they see Russia as a threat. and are willing to, you know, as I said, are willing to provide resources to address that. And I think, you know, I agree with the senator. I think also Americans and Europeans, I think, respond to events. I mean, I remember there was very public opinion said America was not very concerned about ISIS until some folks got beheaded. And suddenly, literally, almost overnight, the people who said, you know, we need to do confront ISIS, it went up about 20 plus points at the polls almost overnight. And the kinds of events that the Atlantic Council did last night with the honoring of the freedom fighters who are now in, on the front lines of the new fight for freedom in Europe, I think it was very powerful and I think it's important that these kinds of events happen. And I think when Americans see that and hear the stories of the people who are fighting for their freedom in Europe, Americans respond to that and, and, they'll, and they'll come around. I just sort of a couple of more concrete questions. The issue of arming Ukraine. There's 
aside from Lithuania, there's no appetite in Europe to do anything like that at all. And the further west you go, the, the, the less appetite there is. Uh, there's some talk in Congress of, of, of moving forward with something like that. What's the, what's the state of play on that, and, and how do you see that shaping out? Um, I think there's bipartisan support in Congress for providing lethal weapons. I think not only because there's a view that um, it's important to the Ukrainians, it sings and sends an important signal to them, but it also sends a signal to Putin about, and it forces him to um, have more at stake in what he's doing in Ukraine. Now, there's been a disagreement with the administration on that, and so I think that has to be resolved before anything will go forward, and, and that, I think, has a lot to do with the position of the Europeans. You know, the, the president has really responded to Germany and to France, to the Minsk, um, the second Minsk agreement, and has not been willing to send in lethal weapons. But, but I do think that as time goes on, as Putin um, <coughs> fails to comply with the Minsk agreement and continues to his aggression in other parts of Ukraine, that that will be reevaluated. And I think there's, there's two uh, sort of misunderstandings or mischaracterizations that get in the way of the clarity we need to, to, for Europe and the United States to reach agreement on that issue. One is this notion that, well, what's the point of arming the Ukrainians? They can't defeat the Russian army. Well, that's true. But what arming the Ukrainians can do is, one, recognize the right of people to have the means to defend their country against evasion, but two, it will raise the cost of what Russian is doing in Ukraine. Because we know that even President Putin is sensitive to body bags, it's, it, it sounds coarse to say it, to bo but it's true, to body bags coming back with Russian soldiers who've been killed in this adventure in Ukraine. So arming can raise the cost of Russian policy. And the second thing that people say is, well, there's no military solution to the crisis in Ukraine. There's only a political solution. And that is also true. But the point is, when you're dealing with ISIS or when you're dealing with uh, a Russian policy, as we see in Ukraine, there's going to be no political solution that does not have a military element. And so this is the point about using economic, military, diplomatic re means in a coordinated fashion to reach a political solution. But to say that there is no political solution, uh, there is no military solution, you know, is only half the argument. Because there's no political solution that's not going to have a military element. And that's one of the powerful arguments for arming. But do you have a, do you have a sense that in the administration uh, that there, that whatever Congress does, that they will actually send anti-tank rockets to, to Ukraine? Or is that, is that just not going to happen? You know, it, it depends. Again, we respond to events. And I think uh, one of the things that may have motivated, and the senator's going to be more authoritative uh, on this than I, but I think one of the things that may have motivated thinking in the administration is, well, we've got Minsk too. We want Minsk too to be respected by the Russians if we start visibly and overtly moving arms into the Ukrainian, it gives them a pretext to get out of Minsk too. I would hope, though, that the administration has sent a quiet signal to our, and with, a, with the agreement of our friends and allies in Europe, a, a, a quiet signal to President Putin that if he does not come into compliance with Minsk, school, Minsk too or violates it, then arms to Ukraine will be on the table. I would hope that would be done. And secondly, I think, you know, we tend to talk too much, <laughs> talk more than we act, and sometimes act overtly when, you know, we should be doing some things covertly. So uh, one of the things I would hope is that at some point arms start showing up in Ukraine from Western sources. And I think in some sense that would have the biggest impact on President Putin's calculation of anything we could do. That's... Uh... The U.S. has gotten into trouble with that in the past, uh, with covert arms, but... Uh, We've gotten in trouble with it in, it in the past. We've also made some great accomplishments right. in the past. Like all of these instruments, they can be used wisely, they can be used foolishly. And one of the questions is, you know, make sure we use it wisely. But uh, 
the possibility that we could use it fool, foolishly uh, only ought to incentivize us to use it wisely. It shouldn't take it off the table. But, but I think that's the point, that I don't think it's off the table right. um, for the long term. Now, it's off the table right now, but it really depends on circumstances and on you know, what Putin does. I'm curious there as well, uh, there's been a talk on, on some of these panels about uh, the Eastern Partnership and how the EU reaches out to countries like Ukraine, Georgia, uh, Moldova. Um, the, uh, the summit in, in Riga was generally disappointing. The, the EU did its usual contortions to avoid uh, openly uh, providing a, some sort of a, a path to, to eventual EU membership for those, for those countries. What's the US vision for, for how those countries uh, uh, in the Russian term near abroad should be, should be treated by, by the West? I certainly hope that ultimately we would see a path to EU membership for all of those countries. <coughs> now it's going to require action in, in the countries to reform the corruption that exists in many of them to address economic challenges that they face. But I think as we think about what, what is the future of Europe, I hope it's going to be um, continued willingness to support um, the countries that are not currently part of the EU. And um, for those that are looking west, um, Georgia, Moldova, um, Ukraine, that we support them in that effort and that they see a path to join the EU. I completely agree, and I think we're seeing some progress on that. Uh, in the conversations now that are beginning about looking to the NATO summit uh, in, uh, in Warsaw, um, people are talking now about uh, the sense that one of the downsides of Bucharest in 2008 and the decision led by the Europeans not to give Georgia and Ukraine map was that somehow the door had been closed on NATO enlargement and people are beginning to say, we need to show that that door is open and the way to do it would be in, in, uh, in the NATO summit in Warsaw to say that uh, um, Macedonia and Montenegro should be members of NATO and are on a membership track. I think that would be a very strong signal. It does not raise all the issues about Ukraine and Georgia membership that have been very controversial in Europe, but it's a way to show that the door remains open uh, on NATO, and I would hope that the EU would find a way to send a, sim sig a similar signal. And I think one of the things, and I'm, I'm going to get into trouble for this, but one of the things the EU needs to think about is Putin, the President Putin's strategy is to create frozen conflicts that then freeze countries between Russia and between the EU on the theory that the EU would not touch them if there is a frozen conflict. Well, what if the EU took that off the table and said that in the same way they were willing to take the Greek portion of Cyprus into the EU without the Turkish portion, there, that frozen conflicts is not a barrier for countries to move forward on a track for EU membership. Let's start taking away levers that support Russian policy. Let's show that the door is open to NATO by taking uh, Macedonia and Montenegro in, and let's find a way for the EU to make a, a, a clear statement that a frozen conflict is not a reason why a country cannot move towards uh, EU, associate, EU membership. And, you know, not lose focus on progress that has been made. Um, the Balkans is a place where um, I've had a chance to visit and to hear the concerns and to see real progress between Serbia and Kosovo, to see Croatia, um, to still feel concerns about what's happening in Bosnia. And we can't lose focus on what's going on in those countries because they then go backwards. And when they want to, um, Serbia wants to continue their pathway into the EU and they're still waiting for the EU to respond in some areas. Um, Stephen talked about Macedonia and NATO, but one of the things that we don't want is because of um, you know, the latest crisis, whether it's Ukraine or Georgia or where it is, um, to allow us to lose the focus on the progress that's been made in those countries 
um, where they are still looking to get into the EU, they're still looking west, and we need to continue to encourage them. You can sort of see the problem of in, in countries where there's a sense that encouragement is lacking, like the, the problems that now in, in Macedonia and what's going on in Moldova, that, that when they sort of run into this, uh, uh, they see this endless passage without, without an end resolution, okay. that, that the political uh, initiative just sort of uh, disappears in those, in those countries. And, and, you know, one of the things I think both United States and Europe needs to think about in terms of all these institutions is, again, our processes for considering membership and establishing these very organized systematic tracks to membership may have made sense when, quite frankly, Europe was not in crisis. But because of Russian policy in the last year or two, Europe is in a different place. And I think we need to re-examine these mechanisms uh, and really decide whether they are appropriate. They become very bureaucratized, if you will. Uh, without any sort of political or strategic framework. And I think we need to reconsider them. And I'll give you one example in terms of, uh, uh, again, NATO enlargement. We have this notion of MAP, uh, a membership action plan, and a structured process by which a country moves uh, to membership. Well, if, um, if, you are Ru if Russian policy is for no more members for NATO, then once you put a country on map, you've basically invited them to be a target by the Russians to try to uh, derail their passage to membership. Maybe we've got to have a less structured process. Not that countries don't need to be prepared for NATO membership, but maybe you prepare them quietly, if you will, and then at some point when you think you're ready, you just make them members. After all, Germany was brought into the NATO alliance at a time when it did not have a standing army. And it was done because there was a strategic framework. And I think in some sense, one of the challenges we have is to recognize the world has changed in Europe, it is a European crisis, and we need a different strategic framework for these processes in which we've uh, fallen in love over the last 20 years. It certainly was the hope in Georgia in 2008. I remember talking to the defense minister yeah. uh, who had this large NATO flag behind his desk uh, in the fairly forlorn hope that, that, uh, that there was some hope coming, uh, some rescue coming from that quarter. Um, I'd like to open the... Uh, the floor to questions. Uh, we've got about uh, 15 minutes to go, and I think there's a couple of microphones uh, in the hall, so if somebody has a question, please uh, please put up your hand and go. Go right ahead. Um, Marek Svetchenski, Politica Insight. Um, uh, this will be a question to both the Senator and Dr. Hadley. Since you both agree that um, m a more proactive policy towards Russia is needed, could you please elaborate how should, the, should it look like? Thank you. Well, I think we've we have. identified a number of the pieces right. of that. Um, we've talked about continued um, activities through NATO, um, and joint with um, countries in Europe, uh, training exercises. Um, you know, we have a big one with the Baltics and Poland that's starting, um, I think it's already starting this week. I'm going to go to Latvia tomorrow, and I'm going to have a chance to to go um, see a little bit of that exercise. It means um, continued equipment. Um, Stephen talked about having equipment stationary and rotating troops in so that um, there's always someone there. Continued economic support. I think counter-propaganda um, effort. So I think we've got to look at a whole range of responses. Yeah, and I think we outlined them here. I think Senators summarized them. Counter the propaganda. States at risk have to help harden themselves, and we have to help harden them. We talked about long-term things to reduce uh, Russian leverage, short-term things to try to deter the Russians. The other thing I think we did not mention, and we both agree on, is Ukraine has to succeed. Ukraine has to succeed. And we have to recognize that it is a country facing an enormous existential challenge. And again, we can't do things in our traditional, methodical, bureaucratic way. We've got to assess what they do about their public and private debt. And we're going to have to do it, support them in doing something dramatic, because they will not extricate themselves from the economic crisis that Russian invasion has 
intentionally put them in. Russia is banking on Ukraine failing and that we will allow Ukraine to fail. That is the Russian strategy for Ukraine, and that at some point the Ukrainian people will decide that turning west was a mistake and they ought to come back and become part of the new Russian empire. That's the strategy. And it's also a way to separate Europe and the United States. Um, so, you know, making sure that we help Ukraine succeed is a way to thwart Putin in all those areas. Right. Great. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, first a comment. Uh, this is uh, connecting to not permanent stationing of NATO troops in Can you identi Eastern. identify Piotr yourself? Piotr Grodziński, uh, MFA. Um, uh, in the NATO-Russia founding act, uh, there is a statement that in present circumstances, and this I would stress, it is a document from mid-90s, there is no need for permanent uh, stationing of NATO troops in the uh, new allies. Uh, uh, now, the circumstances have changed dramatically. I understand there is certain reluctancy of some states uh, to uh, forget about NATO founding act. Uh, uh, but uh, this uh, does not really sound uh, too well in the Eastern Europe because it's East Central Europe because it sounds as if uh, sooner or later we'll return to business as usual with uh, uh, Russians. Uh, uh, I just want to remind uh, President uh, Komorowski's remark uh, the other day when he mentioned a Polish concept, chata, which means uh, presence of a small uh, sec military section watching uh, possible adversaries uh, on what they are doing. Now, I would argue that... Could we get a, uh, quest could we get a question, please? Uh, uh, I would like to... Uh, okay, this is my comment. Uh, the question is on China. Uh, uh, I understand the pivot, uh, because the China potential. Mr. Timothy uh, Gardenash mentioned that China is the problem. Uh, what role do you think the uh, European-US cooperation could have uh, in uh, common policy towards China and trying to embed China in uh, what we would believe to be a free world? So uh, let me do it in reverse order and you can... Uh, on China, I think Europe and the United States are not cooperating enough and should have a common approach to China. I think one of the things that Europe is so, uh, has internal challenges, they absorb a lot of energy, and I think, quite frankly, Europe needs to be more of a partner with the United States and Asia. On your first point, I think certainly uh, there, there is a basis to say that the um, prerequisites or the foundation of the Russian uh, Founding Act um, has changed and that we could, given Russian policy, um, station forces permanently on, in, in Europe. But the truth is that's not how American forces operate anymore. You know, we are more about this rotational presence is not something we've adopted so we can avoid violating the founding act. It is in fact the way we operationalize, as I understand it, our concept of operations of how we do uh, presence overseas. It is this rotational presence. So we could, I think, given Russian behavior, say the Founding Act is suspended, we're going to station forces permanently. Actually, we don't need to do that to create what is essentially a permanent presence on the continent of Europe. And it is more consistent to do it in this rotational way with just how we operate the force these days. So in some sense, we can have our cake and eat it too. Well, and I would just add to that, as I said earlier, I think we sort of come to where we are now with our history in World War II and in the Cold War. And the reality is that things have changed, that circumstances have changed, that the way we wage wars have changed, and that we need to have our military response um, be responsive to those changes, and that that's one of the things that the rotation of troops and, and looking at how we do things 
is different, and so it is responsive to the current situation. Right. Um, to go back to China, you know, I, I agree with Stephen. I think we need to be um, more cooperative and think about ways in which we can um, work together, Europe and the United States on China. But one of the responses from the Obama administration in looking at China's influence, in particularly in Asia, is to uh, negotiate the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the trade agreement. Now, as if you've read the papers, you know we're having some issues in Congress about how we're going to respond and whether whether we're going to allow that to go forward. But that's one way of reducing China's economic influence. China's not part of that agreement now, but it will help if it goes through, set the rules of the road that will then force China to respond in certain ways to, um, to how we're going to uh, play economically in the region. Great, thanks very much. Um, I'll grab the last question and just sort of maybe end with a worst case scenario. Uh, there is this scenario that uh, r the Russian economy is uh, in a long term decline, that Putin has a window of opportunity before the EU and the US galvanize and start coordinating more closely, perhaps sending weapons to Ukraine and that sort of thing. And that if he wants to act, he's got a year or two to do so. The, the, the point of pressure is to do something in the Baltics of uh, either like in the Crimea or more likely uh, the sudden emergence of an of a, a ethnic Russian militia in Latvia or in Estonia. And uh, the gamble being that uh, the NATO does nothing and that there's conferences called and that sort of thing and that, uh, and that and basically ends up showing that Article 5 doesn't work and that the alliance is a fiction and, and, and he scores an enormous victory for Russian foreign policy. What do you see as the, do you see that as a, as, a, as, a, as a danger? Is that something that the EU and the US need to be aware of and to start working more, more swiftly to close that window? Somebody has made the point to me that empires in decline are much, are much more dangerous than empires on the rise. And so I think there is a continued threat and we need to think about what Putin may do. I actually don't believe that NATO would abrogate a challenge to Article 5 to one of its members. I think that's absolutely critical, that NATO would need to respond to that. And, uh, and so I think Putin plays a very dangerous game if he thinks that that's um, his next move. I, if I might, I was in a conversation with Radek Sikorsky, and he said, the question is, is this 1914, is this 1938, or is this 1941? And are we at a situation where Russia, seeing its trend lines going uh, negative, thinks there's a window of opportunity in the next year to do something? It's one of the reasons why the next year, I think, is a dangerous period. We have to take that into account in our strategy but we not, cannot be deterred from having a strategy because of that risk. And so my own thought is the combination is to take a set of measures that will hopefully deter President Putin from initiating further action either in Ukraine or elsewhere. And we'll convince him that, that this, is not, this policy is not working for Russia. But then, to hold open the prospect, and the administration has, has done this, of negotiating a resolution for the Ukrainian crisis that takes Russian interests into account, legitimate Russian interests into account. And that means a formula whereby Ukraine can move west as its people want to do to affiliate with Western institutions, but in a way that doesn't require it to sever its economic and historical ties with Russia or place a burden on the Russian economy or undermine the Russian economy and convince Russia in that context that it's actually in its interest to work with the United States and the EU to actually build a prosperous Ukraine. That's where we want to get. The problem is I think we have not done enough to deter uh, Russian policy and to convince them that they need to find a different way. And, and the question is also whether this is in Russia's interest or whether it's in Putin's interest. And the, the two aren't necessarily um, this is true. 
exactly. don't necessarily coincide. That is right. Exactly. Uh, Senator Shaheen, Dr. Hadley, thank you very much for taking part in our panel. And thank you very much uh, to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much.